The Actor CEO Podcast, Episode 26. Going up. You're an actor, but you're also a business. Take control of your career by learning how to manage it like a boss. Be driven. Be responsible. Be in control. Be an actor CEO. And now, your host, Mike Moreno. Hello, and welcome to the Actor CEO Podcast. Thank you for joining me on this journey of learning, exploration, and dedication. If you want to keep getting tips and tricks from industry pros, established actors, and hardworking artists, make sure you subscribe to this podcast. That way, when you're on the go to your next audition, commuting home from work, or at the gym, you can take a moment to listen and get some serious insight into building a better career by becoming an actor CEO. Hey actors, what if I told you you could take acting class with Kevin Spacey or Dustin Hoffman? You'd freak out, right? And then you'd ask, okay, how much? Masterclass is an online learning service that gives you access to acting classes with these master actors for just 90 bucks. You can't even rent rehearsal space in New York City for that much, and you get hours of exclusive footage you won't find anywhere else, worksheets and templates, and a community forum to connect you with other passionate performers. This is access you can't find elsewhere, and the knowledge that these two titans of film and stage deliver in these courses is priceless. Click the link on the homepage at ActorCEO.com or find it on the resources page at ActorCEO.com slash resources. Masterclass provides phenomenal content, so don't miss your chance to learn from the greats. Now back to the show. All right. Hey, welcome to the Actor CEO podcast. Uh, we are trying out some very brand new technology here, running a uh, live stream through a webcasting software called uh, Open Broadcast Software. So it might send, there might be some double sound happening, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to fix that in a short moment here and uh, get everything going so that we can get this podcast rolling. Today, I am super excited because I've got a very good friend of mine who I just met recently, but I'm sure she's going to become a very good friend. Uh, her name is Carly Zion, and she is joining me uh, from here in New York City. And we are... Uh, going to be talking about her as an actor, a Yale grad working here in New York City, and then also a coaching business that she runs where she helps actors uh, prepare for uh, MFA auditions, which I think is very important. She's got uh, a really good plan about how to prepare for getting into MFA schools and what it is, what are the most important things to think about when you're uh, looking to audition for those schools and why they're important, why a grad school is important. So help me welcome... Carly Zion to the show. Carly, thanks so much for being here. Yay. Thank you so much for having me, Mike. Yeah. I am uh, super stoked that you're here. Tell me, first of all, when did you graduate from Yale, which is fantastic. Congratulations on that. When did you graduate? How long have you been here in New York City? And how long have you been doing your uh, coaching side of things? Um, I graduated from the Yale School of Drama uh, in that, from the acting program in 2014. Um, and promptly started my coaching company, which is called Carly Zion Coaching. Very creative name that I uh, came up with there. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Pretty straightforward. Yeah. Um, I am Carly and I do the coaching. So you get what you invest in. Um, yeah, I started that right after school along with, you know, the traditional um, actor day job of uh, of babysitting. Um, but I knew that I wanted to help people with, uh, a process that can be really tricky. And, um, I also have a, an undergrad degree in theater studies. So I have read a lot of plays and, um, I thought, well, I'm one of those people kind of like those musical theater people who they just know every song in every show. And you can just go to them and ask them for 50, recommendations. Right. I feel like I can be one of those people in terms of plays. And I also just love theater. I love going to theater and reading plays. So um, I'd like to think that I, I, I have my finger on the pulse uh, in a way. Um, and so I thought that I could use that, um, that knowledge to, to help people. And I also really like working um, as a teacher so, um, I just started the company and, um, people started coming to me that fall and this is the third year and it's going great. And 
there are people auditioning as we record this podcast and um it's really really exciting and rewarding and That's fantastic um cool yeah yeah so i went to the urdas in order to get into grad school is that happening right now or is, or is there something similar or is it individual uh, auditions that are happening right now the urdas are happening i also did the urdas when i was auditioning for grad school mm -hmm. um where did you go i went to the university of tennessee oh right knoxville cool mm -hmm. cool cool um yeah so those are happening and um also the the schools like juilliard and, and yale and nyu are having their auditions um since i think they started last weekend and then they tend to go into the first couple weeks of february that's right yeah, that reminds me why I thought it was a little bit later, because I actually auditioned in California, in San Francisco, because I was living in Los Angeles at the time. So that those were the Erd auditions I went to. But there, of course, were the two before one, I think, here in New York City and then one possibly in Chicago. And then right. they made their way out to uh, the West Coast. So that's why it was. Yeah. Later yeah. I think the I think uh, they'll be making their way across the country in the next in the next few weeks. Because as far as I know, there are auditions happening this weekend uh, in New York, but then they'll be moving and doing their weekends in the Midwest and the West Coast as well. Amazing. So, so this is pretty incredible. The fall that you graduated, you were getting coaching clients? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's fantastic. Way to go. They put their faith in me. And um, I just thought, you know, why I, I can pass on. First of all, I... I was really, I mean, I consider myself really lucky to have been able to go to the Yale School of Drama sure. and, and like there, you know, and, and, and I wanted to pass on a little bit of what I'd learned, especially, um, especially with, you know, um, teachers like Ron Van Lu, mm. um, you know, I'm, he's retiring and he, he, Ron Van Lu for your li listeners, like is kind of a legendary American acting teacher who has worked for the last 30 years or so, um, at NYU and at Yale and right. the, you know, the actors he's trained uh, so many, so many talented people who are working right now. And, um, I'm so lucky that I got to study with him and I'm happy to pass on some of the stuff that I learned, um, you know, and not nearly as eloquent or, um, uh, magnanimous a way, but, you know, to be able to pass that on to the people I work with and also some of the stuff I learned about Shakespeare um, and just the, the like scene study basics that um, and, and like text work basics that I learned that I think can really help people as they're moving into the grad school process. That's fantastic. Now, you have a Facebook website, right? I mean, you've got a Facebook page going and I think you also have a website for coaching as well. Yeah. Yeah. So the Facebook page is Carly Zion Coaching. Um, and the, and you can contact, contact me through that website. And then you can also just go to my actor website, which is carlyzion.com, C-A-R-L-Y-Z-I-E-N.com. And there's a coaching tab on that page where you can email me and we can talk Fantastic. about whatever you want to talk about. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if anybody, uh, if you're watching, uh, this Facebook live and you want to, uh, get a link right to that. Just say coaching in the uh, comments and we'll drop a link for you right away. That way you can get uh, straight away, straight to Carly and uh, find out all this wonderful stuff that she uh, works on. So what, Carly, are some of the top misconceptions that you think actors coming out of, say, a BFA program or looking to get into MFA have about that audition process? The misconceptions about the MFA audition process. Yeah. Um, that's a really good question. Mm. I, I, people specifically for people who are coming straight out of undergrad. Well, certainly anybody tackling that that part of the process, but you know there it might be a misconception coming out of uh, undergrad straight to grad school with a you know not fully understanding what it entails or or what they're looking for at that level. Uh, do you find that yeah. people do you find that it's better that for people to have experience, having real world experience out there for maybe a couple of years working in the industry and then coming to grad school? Yeah. It, so you are, you're asking like, is it worth it to have real world experience versus going straight into MFA? Sure. Yeah. I'm, you know, my class, there were 17 people in my class and mm -hmm. I would say like a third of them came right from undergrad and maybe like the other two thirds of us 
had, um, had some time in New York. I took three years in between undergrad and grad school. And what I've, what I'm seeing is the average age is kind of like 25, 26. Mm -hmm. But that said, like, you know, I know people who went to grad school when they were 40. Mm -hmm. Um, and I do think like it's, it's kind of rare, but, um, you know, don't get discouraged if you feel like you're too, if you're past your prime or, and I would also say, you know, don't worry about, um, wasting three years in school either or four years if you go to places like Juilliard. Um, because like for me, the investment in my craft for the rest of my life and plus like just the people that I met there and the experiences that I had, it's, it's like absolutely, you can't put a price on that. And, um, this is so not the question that you asked, but just (laughs) for me, but, um, I've always kind of identified with characters who are a little bit older, like mid thirties, mm-hmm. um, and knew that for, and, and just had a sense for me that things would really be like in the sweet spot around age 35, I'm 30 now. So, um, so I figured I might as well, you know, go to school if I can and learn what I can now. But yeah, I don't think that, coming straight out of school, uh, versus having time. I really don't think it matters as much anymore because if you're talented and you're right for one of these programs, then I, I think like the people who run the programs are going to admit you regardless of whether or not you've been in the real world. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, they have just like any sort of casting situation, they have gaps to fill. They have needs. Yeah. And uh, mm-hmm. they've got a program to run that is looking to scale in a certain way. And if they if you fit those needs, if you can fill those gaps, then obviously you're you're quite valuable to them. Of right. course, you have to bring talent and uh, a mm-hmm. skill set in in with you. But uh, you're not going to be judged by the fact that someone's got a longer resume than you because you know this school has uh, it's it's got a, its wheels have to keep turning. And uh, if you can make that exactly. happen, then that's useful. Um, yeah, so for exactly. yourself, uh, in terms of, uh, coaching for, for the auditions, right. We talked about, mm-hmm. I asked about what the misconceptions might be, but, uh, what are some of the top, uh, top tips that you try to convey to your, um, clients about, um, doing auditions for an MFA program? Well, first of all, the first thing that I like to tell people is, that it's not about getting in to a program. It's about giving a gift to the people that you're auditioning for. The gift being Mm. portions of four different plays uh, performed by you. And nobody else can do that because nobody else is you. So, um, you know, that's why we go see Kenneth Branagh play Hamlet and Jude Law play Hamlet and Ethan Hawke play Hamlet and Fiona Shaw play Hamlet because we want to see them do it. You know, of course, we know that to be or not to be speech, but we want to see that specific actor playing that character and how they interpret it. So first of all, I tell them it's this is not about getting. It's about giving to the people that you're going to be um, presenting to. Um, and also that it's, you know, if obviously I can't guarantee any kind of result. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so I also tell actors to make it about an artistic process that's fulfilling for them and trying to find that throughout the, the process of prepping for this audition. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, instead of like, what are they looking for? It's more like, let's find four pieces that you really, really love Mm. and we'll work on them. And then you'll go in there and have fun. And regardless of what happens, obviously like not to minimize that it's disappointing if things don't work out. Um, regardless of what happens, you'll come out with four pieces and like hopefully a better sense of yourself as an artist and an actor. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, I think that's great advice auditioning anytime 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Don't be trying to think, go in there thinking you're going to do what they are looking for because you don't know exactly what that is. And they may not even know exactly what that is. Like you say, do what you love. Right. Something that showcases don't. you well that you can come in fully committed to and uh, and really breathe life into a role for those two minutes that you have and then walk away. Yeah, exactly. And um, I'll share with you another great tip that uh, a friend gave me after I graduated because I, I was, this is a friend who um, also went to an MFA program and he's been very successful. Um, you know, he, if I said his name, people would know who, who this person is. And, um, and he, I was, I was complaining to him because I had been auditioning for about six months and hadn't booked anything even though I was getting, um, callbacks and meeting people and getting to work on cool things. And he said, Carly, you don't know how to, you've been out for six months. You have no idea how to audition. And I was like, what, how how dare you say that? (laughs) But he said, there are three, he said, I'll, I'll give you this tip. And now I love this tip and I tell it to everybody who I coach with. Um, but it's really changed my audition process as well. Um, he's like, there are three types of people who audition Carly. There's the save me people. There's the screw you people. Uh And there's the shall we dance people. Right. So if you think about that, I was totally a save me. I'm a recovering save me person. Right. So if you go in there with this, and this applies to grad school and to regular auditions. Like if you go in there with this vibe of like, hi, I'm, so unworthy of being here, but thank right. you so much for having me. Oh my God, it's crazy weather outside, right? And you try to have this like conversation with them and you're like, so-and-so from the something theater in the middle of nowhere says, hi. Um, okay, should I just do my piece now? Oh my God, I'm so nervous. That would be a save me person. right? And then screw you person would be someone who you know, kind of has an attitude and doesn't feel like doesn't really engage very much, doesn't give that much, but, um, you know, is intriguing in his or her own way because Mm. they don't seem, you know, give a shit. Can I swear on this podcast? Oh yeah. It's the internet. I just (laughs) did. (laughs) Um, and, uh, and then the shall we dance people are the people who come in. Hi, thank you so much. Take control of the room take your chair, sit in the chair, do your piece. Thank you guys so much. Is there anything else I can do for you in this moment? No. Great. It was great to meet you both and, um, and then leave and go back to your life. Yeah. And that philosophy has, has changed the way that I audition. And I, I really like passing that on because, um, it really makes a difference. Oh, and that's another thing. Yeah, that's another thing, Mike, is is that um, is that it's not just about the, the acting, the pieces that you do. It's about the whole vibe, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, especially for grad school. They're going to want to they're going to want to admit people who they want to spend three years with and you're not going to be at your best. <laughs> and so it's the whole vibe. Yeah. And it's what you wear and it's the pieces that you pick. And, um, yeah, can't just go in there and the whole thing is the presentation from the moment you walk into the building. Oh, absolutely. Uh, so are there, are there exercises or, or, uh, certain practices that you've found not only as an, uh, an actor yourself and, uh, some of these great tips that come from, uh, people who have been doing it perhaps a little bit longer than you, mm-hmm. uh, are there skills and uh, practices and exercises that you've found to be very successful to get people in that centered, focused place, understanding why they're there and they can bring that really solid, confident and uh, creative energy into an audition without being scattered? Yeah. Well, the number one thing I would recommend for that is meditation. Mm. Um, Me too. Yeah. I mean, honestly, actor people like, I mean, the, uh, the average actor, (laughs) myself being one of them is running around like their hair's on fire. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Especially if you do musical theater. No, just kidding. (laughs) 
Just kidding, musical theater. And people. the comments you explode. Amaze, <laughs> you um, you amaze me constantly, and I can't. I just don't have the. I don't. Ha- I just can't do that. I can't do mm. what you guys do. Um, yeah, my number one tool for sure, meditation. Um, because even though sometimes I feel this way, like acting is not the most important thing in my life, and it's mm. not like the base level of who I am. There are deeper layers than that. Yeah. Um, and I find that with meditation, I can get in touch with that. And, um, and it, and it requires, it trains my mind to focus. Mm. So, and that focus helps me memorize. It helps mm. me, um, in the rehearsal room. It helps me when I've got adrenaline after an audition right. to sit and breathe, be able to breathe and, and let it pass. Right. As opposed to, you know, going and eating candy or <laughs> spending money or, you know, doing something that's destructive. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. And and so I, I've definitely recommended meditation to to my coaches. And for me, like it, it's completely, completely changed my life. Um, I remember reading something with Leslie Odom Jr. Mm. Um, from Hamilton mm-hmm. who, and and someone was interviewing him. I think it was on Playbill about like tips for actors. And he said like the number one thing for any actor, any artist, really anyone is, is to have some sort of spiritual practice. And I'll just, you know, amend that to just say for me, it's meditation. Mm -hmm. Um, and especially in a, in an MFA audition situation where sometimes it's the entire day and you're around a bunch of people who, are really emotional and really nervous. Um, it really just helps to have that kind of practice. It's so, so useful. I've found, um, I've been trying to do it more myself. Uh, you know, recently I've Mm -hmm. got a 19 month old son, so there's a lot that can pull me away from (laughs) being grounded and focused on something that I need to do, uh, for an extended period of time, if not, you know, a full rehearsal period or a full day. But uh, meditation is for, for definitely for me has been a key, and one of the really helpful steps forward in that process for myself was hearing uh, from uh, from a Buddhist monk. And I'll post the link when I find the link for this video. I'll post it in the comments. If you want to hear about it, just write meditation in the comments, and I will uh, get you that link because I think it's really helpful. It's like a two minute video, but basically talking about uh, the idea that you can do meditation at any point in the day, anywhere. It doesn't have to be something where you set aside 30 minutes or you set aside even 15 minutes to sit in a quiet room and and sit in the dark. I live in New York City. I can't do that. Mm -hmm. I really can't. It doesn't doesn't happen all the time. When I do that, it's a luxury. But I know how useful meditation is for me. So I have to find ways when I'm on my way to the audition, when I'm waiting in the audition room, when I'm coming Mm -hmm. back on the train or however it might be. If you're in L.A., when you're driving in your car on the way there. What can you do to give yourself right. even 30 seconds, even a minute of calm, right. centered, breath supported uh, energy, grounded energy? And you do that enough throughout the day in those little moments when you only have 30 seconds or a minute and a half to do that, mm-hmm. you're going to be much more accustomed to it, much more used to it, and you can drop into your center and come in. Uh, in a different place, in the place you want to be, that is really your honest, honest, truthful self. And uh, he didn't he didn't call it this, but I sort of called it this for myself to remember it. As I call them, micro meditations. And it could be when you're yeah. drinking your tea. It could be when you're you know waiting for the train arri- to arrive. Um, it could be walking down the street. If you decide to make that a moment of meditation, you don't have to have your eyes closed, but you can do those things that calm your body: the breathing, the relaxing the listening, all that stuff. And all those things, breath, relaxation, listening, it's all like acting one, two, three, right? Absolutely, right. (laughs) Not to mention you can have like more present conversations with your friends and you with your son and all that stuff too. So there's no downside really. (laughs) Yeah, that's so true. So Carly, you mentioned that you've been reading plays like like a mad person, right? Uh, so that's really something that you've decided yeah. to increase is your knowledge of of the landscape of uh, 
of playwrights and uh, new work that's out there and all mm -hmm. this wonderful stuff. It, are there some recommendations mm -hmm. you can throw out yeah. there? Are there, there are some channels that we should be looking into that uh, a lot of people don't see, and especially for audition material? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, first of all, if you live in New York City, obviously, do you know what I'm going to say, Mike? <laughs> the drama bookstore. Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, is probably the best resource available to anyone who lives in the tri-state area. Um, right. The people who work there are incredible. They've read everything. Um, they all have their own taste. And, you know, it's just mm -hmm. a, it's an amazing resource. And, um, you know, I, I've taken students there before to just, like, look through plays. And I'll give them a stack of plays and be like, look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this. And I tell... Um, I tell them not to read the play, look for a character that's in your age bracket, look mm. for the speeches in the play. And then if you like it and you connect with it, then read the play. Um, mm. But so, but you can also like, if you're not in New York city, you can go to the library. You can check out 15 plays at a time. I wish there mm. were more plays available online. Obviously all of Shakespeare mm. is available online. Um, go see plays like luckily we're, you know, I can, I, I think there's a, I mean, hopefully you have a good regional theater in your area, go see any of the contemporary stuff that they're doing. You know, I think mm. some of the most popular work over the last five or six years that's been happening. Ha, um, and I'm basing this on like plays that started in New York and then have gone to the regional places. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, please jump in on this mic, but like Annie Baker, Amy Herzog, um, Jarrell, uh, Terrell McCraney, um, right. Brandon Jacobs, Brandon Jenkins. Jacob Jenkins. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There Brandon Jacob Jenkins. A lot of these people have, um, are, you know, playwrights in their twenties and thirties who mm -hmm. went to, some of them went to playwriting programs. Some of them didn't, but like, just look up playwrights from Juilliard over the last 10 years and look at their plays. Mm -hmm. I also suggest if you're, you know, a person of color or you're, you come from an ethnic background that, um, you know, has a specific playwriting, um, uh, has plays written for you to definitely read those plays, you know? So if mm. you, if you're, if you come from a Latin American background or, you know, anything like read Stephen Adley Gurgis, read, um, uh, Jesus hop the A train and, and mm. motherfucker with the hat. You know, if you're black, read August Wilson, read Raisin in the Sun, read, um, Terrell, Brandon Jacob, Brand Jenkins. Brandon Jacob <laughs> Jenkins, because if you're going into an audition for a grad school, I think that they're going to want to know that you've, that you know what's happening in theater mm. and you're mm. going to be auditioning for these parts, you know, mm. like, I have auditioned for bad Jews a lot because <laughs> I'm Jewish right. um, mm -hmm. and my, and I have curly hair on my headshot and that's by um, Josh Harmon who also wrote mm -hmm. significant other. That's another really good um, example of a playwright who's writing cool stuff right now. Um, right. But like, you're going to want to audition for the stuff that you are. I mean, you will be auditioning for the stuff that you are. So if you're black, you're going to want to read August Wilson you know? Right. And if you have Italian heritage, you're going to want to read John Patrick Shanley, you know? Right. You're going to want to read Irish plays. If you're Irish, Martin McDonough is the only one I can think of right now. <laughs> Brian Friel, mm. um, mm. stuff like that. I'm, I went on a ramble there. Uh, that, no, that's great advice. Yeah. Yeah. Look for playwrights who share your, your history. You know, I love Chekhov and I think part of it's because I'm I have Russian in my in my blood, you know, but a lot of people right. love Chekhov. So, <laughs> <laughs> hey, actor CEOs, Mike Moreno here. I hope you're enjoying this episode of the podcast. I just want to take a second to remind you to sign up for our newsletter at actorceo.com slash newsletter. When you do, you'll get exclusive content delivered to your inbox on Monday alongside the episode release. It's a great way to add tools to your arsenal like an audition scene database, video tutorials with guests, deals on business cards and headshots, and many more that are only offered in the newsletter. Take your career to the next level and sign up at actorceo.com slash newsletter. Now back to the show. Just read, read, yeah, see so what you like, and then read everything by that point, right? 
Absolutely. And I think uh, you sort of bring up a good point, which, of course, you know, if, if you are connected to these plays or these writers in such a way that you're the audience or you're the type of um, you're what they're writing about. Uh, right. then obviously it's very useful for you. But uh, when you were speaking about you know, going into the library, the drama workshop, uh, you didn't directly say it, but I think one of the ways to approach looking for those new types of work, especially if you have a resource like the drama uh, bookshop, to talk mm -hmm. to somebody who knows a lot about what's going on in there or right. has uh, you know, a deep knowledge of, of the characters and the types that are portrayed in these works, mm -hmm. coming in, understanding what is a good type for you yeah. If you know your type really well, mm -hmm. and then you know, okay, hey, look, uh, I play villains really well, mm -hmm. um, arrogant, you know, uh, 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 upper class, uh, old British in old British plays or something, <laughs> and uh, also like you know, extreme uh, vulgar comedy or something like right, that. Right, right. Like those yeah. would be three things that describe me pretty well, and like yeah. things that I can come in and so, like kill in an audition if I have the opportunity to do that. Where are the plays that feature characters like that okay well here you go here's, here's oscar wilde <laughs> exactly now i know where to start <laughs> yeah definitely you i know. think i but also like definitely knowing your type and that in an mfa audition is something that you want to portray accurately so mm -hmm. and i think we we can often really sell ourselves short on that as actors and be like well i'm a character type but like all actors meryl streep is a character actress you know right She's a leading lady, but she's a, she does characters, you know, that's my opinion about that. But, um, uh, that, that we, like, I, 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 I encourage, you know, I encourage people to give yourself the gift of the best parts, you know, because it's going to mm, make it easier well for you to give a good audition. Don't do like the clown from the Tempest, you know, right. do, do Sebastian from 12th, you know, I mean, uh, Ferdinand from the Tempest, you know, mm -hmm. don't, don't like hide. Don't, don't come in and do the nurse, you know, right. Do not that the nurse isn't amazing. I love the nurse, but you know, give, do a leading lady, you know, if you're, right. especially if you're 27, you know? Right. Um, yeah. But even, uh, even understanding that the vibe that that character gives that is, you know, the reason why that character is particularly popular and so many people have done it. Uh, you can find that same vibe even in the same play sometimes, yeah. but uh, yeah. in plays like it or characters like it that someone hasn't seen. So therefore you're, they're not hearing the same repeated pattern yeah. coming into them three, four five times in a row. Yeah. Which, you know, as we all know, that can start, to tune people out a little totally. bit so you have to work harder to get them on your side but right. if you understand that vibe you understand the energy that that character brings in you and that really works for you and you find a different character that does that right. then you go oh great now i can do the same thing but in a way that the from the moment from word one they're going to be like oh i haven't heard this before yeah now, yeah now I'm, now I'm interested definitely i mean i found even just the other day i was watching uh i was watching what was it uh war of the roses oh yeah um uh, through Amazon, and I was, uh, and I'm about to do a reading of uh, of the series and everything. But anyway, um, I was trying to find, you know, some some audition material for uh, an EPA that was coming up. But I was watching this um, this show, and then a character does this like very short little monologue in the middle of this battle, and I was just struck by this piece. Yeah, and I said, "Oh my god." I need to find this. Yeah. This is great. And yeah. it's like extremely short. So it's perfect for an EPA. Yeah. And I found it and I did a little bit of cutting with it. And now it's like, it's a really fiery piece that I have in my back pocket. If I need to go in for something that requires, you know, the, these three characteristics um, in the type of work that they're doing, even though this piece isn't from that play, I know I can come in and nail the type of uh, energy that they're looking for. Right. And it's super, super useful. And no one's going to know about it. No one's going to hear about it. Totally. That's so smart. You're not going to hear that in the day of auditions. Totally. And I mean, the thing is with Shakespeare, like there's only so much, there's only so many plays. Right. And there's only. He's not still writing. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's good writing. Um, but like that's, you know, I have a lot of people who've come and said, well, I don't want to do that because it's overdone. Right. And I'm like, but if you think you can do it better than anybody else, do it, right. you know, and like, like mm. everything's going to be overdone by the end of these auditions because everybody's going to do everything. 
And I'm sure there are ones that are more overdone than others. You know, if you think you can do it better than anybody else, then do it because there's only like 20 monologues anyway. There's more than that, but <laughs> you know, uh, but yeah. 25, and 29. Tops, there's 20. Tops. Yeah. Like roughly 30, <laughs> roughly 30. And sometimes schools will say, please, dear God, do not do puck or do not do the ring speech from 12th night. Um, right. And that's fair. I'll, yeah, and that's fair because, like, and I th- I find too that there are like these weird trends that happen. Like, there were a lot of Cressidas this year, and I mean, for me, oh, and I don't know what happened in the audition room, but like last year, there was a lot of um of uh, comedy of errors happening. Um, right. But uh, and those are great characters, so you know, no judgment on that. It's just weird these like little trends that seem to happen. But there was someone in my class who did to be or not to be <laughs> and he got mm-hmm. in and like, cause he's a, a, an amazingly talented person. And so you never right. know, you never know. Um, you know, I didn't quite have the, the guts to do something like that, but, um, mm-hmm. I have, and I've also, I've also had, I have, I've had women doing men's pieces and men doing women's pieces. So, there you go. um, I that's think another way to look at it. Yeah. I think that's on the, on the table now really with all the gender bending that's been happening in, in, um, in the theater and all the talk about, about gender in the, in our, Oh, absolutely. In the zeitgeist. Absolutely. And again, like if you, especially with Shakespeare, if you connect with it, mm-hmm. then you're going to be bringing a level of truth to it, which again, those words are just sort of this vehicle to let that shine through. Yes. Um, and it will it will open that that vehicle will go as fast and as far as you like as you can power it, but uh, if you connect with it, yeah, and you bring that your your honest truth to it, then boom! I mean, now you've got something that only you can do, right? And that's what makes it unique. That's what makes it powerful, and that's why it's been around for four hundred years, and people keep doing it, right? So you know, thinking about it that way and and flip the perspective and uh, find something that really that really works. Yeah. So Carly, is there like uh, do you find that people you recommend trying to flip your script, let's call it, uh, changing out your uh, audition pieces every so often, or you know, how many do you want to have in your back pocket? Mm. It, for for like just auditioning school in general. No school, in general, say. yeah, like let's go beyond mm. the uh, yeah beyond the MFA. I work. I mean, it depends on where you're at. Are you doing mostly appointments? If you're doing mostly appointments, you probably won't have to give a monologue all that often. So that's okay. Right. If you're doing EPAs, um, what are they saying these days? Like four? I think four is a great number to have. Four yeah. or more. I know that some, I, I remember reading Karen Coolhouse's book about monologues and, um, and she's like, you got to have eight or something like that, which is, mm-hmm. I, I mean, to me, it's like, that. that's great if you have eight, but don't not go on an audition because you only have four, you know? Um, I often find if you're honest, if you go in and you're like, look, I don't have a uh, year in my back pocket, but, um, here's something kind of funny and, and witty, you know? Um, right. Yeah. But in terms of switching them out every so often, I do think that's important. Um, a friend said to me recently, cause I was talking, I was talking about doing something that I wasn't feeling really enthusiastic about. Um, mm. and he said, you know, Carly, there's, there are dead gifts and there are living gifts. <laughs> and I was like, wow. And um, like, for example, I have this one monologue that I've been doing since college. Like that would be a dead gift. It works. Wow. It's it, it works every time because I don't know. It's one of those magic pieces that like, I think the writing is so good that like that it works. Um, but it's mm-hmm. definitely a dead gift because it's it's expired its shelf life is it's past its shelf life. And we all like, I, I mean, you're identifying, you probably know what, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, definitely. So if you've got a dead gift in your back pocket, you might want to find a a live gift. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's a good point. I I remember somebody else uh, at one point in time mentioned, uh, you know, they were like, I just, you know, I don't feel like doing, this piece anymore but i've been doing it for so long right. and that's why i keep doing it it's like an old shoe uh, yeah and maybe it's got me work in the past or whatever yeah. but like i just don't feel energized by it anymore and, and uh whoever they were talking to was like well then it's time to give it up 
Like no matter how how you feel about it, like it's not you know you're not jazzed by it. You gotta you gotta come into it with a fire that's like ooh, totally, totally. This is something I really want to do. Because guess what? Like the other thing about dead gifts is like that people can tell that it's a dead gift. You know, mm. like I can tell. Yeah, that's a good point. I think most of the time when I have a. Uh, uh, somebody who comes in to work with me and they do something and I'm like, you've been doing that since, uh, for how long? Because there's this one way that you do it. And it's like this groove that gets, you dr- keep driving over it over and over and over again. And it's hard to right. resurrect that stuff. Um, so I'm all for recycling, uh, as uh, probably like, you know, every couple of years or so. And it's fun anyway, because then you keep nourishing yourself artistically. <laughs> Absolutely. Don't give a dead gift. <laughs> Get rid of the <laughs> dead. Are there, um, just in regards to now step, we're stepping a little bit further out of just the audition world, but uh, now into the world of working as an actor mm-hmm. uh, in New York City, because obviously you go to these auditions, right? The MFA auditions to get training to then come back to the real world, mm-hmm. the real working world and uh, go out and do these auditions again. Right. Uh, to get jobs and make your living as an actor. Yes. So is there a, is there maybe it's something that you learned through MFA school, but is there a piece of advice or some sort of mantra that you hold on to that has been very helpful for you in, in terms of understanding the business mm. of acting? Um, I would say uh, be nice to people. <laughs> Everyone. Wow. Absolutely. Yeah. Every It's all about relationships. The whole business is about relationships. I mean, most businesses I would think are about relationships and, um, you know, from, from every stage of things, like whether it's your agents who you're working with as a team to communicate, um, or, you know, a manager or something like that, like just communicate because they're people. And, and sometimes I, I talk to, you know, and it's taken me a while to figure this out, but like, um, you know, I remember I used to be really scared to like email my agents and ask them stuff, but really like they're just people, you know, and everyone, right. everyone's just trying to do the, their job and, and do a good job at it. And, and that also like, not just being nice to people, but also we're all allies, you know, just this is a message for these trying times as well. But like, <laughs> we're all on the same team, right? We all right. want to make something beautiful. Um, and your agent wants you to get this job and the casting director wants you to get the job and, Mm -hmm. and, you know, fellow actors, there's a lot of pie. It's not like one person takes a piece of pie and there's less pie. There's a lot of pie out there. And so, you know, especially being able to like celebrate other people's successes is so important. But like, yeah, I would say the one thing is like, be nice to people. Um, because like, like, for example, if you're doing a show at a regional theater or summer stock theater, you know, don't be a diva. Be, know that learn the names of the stage hands, learn the names of the people backstage, the costume designer, the sound designer, the right. interns who are working there for the summer, you know, the, right. the stage manager, the assistant stage manager, thank them for what they're doing. Person in the office, you know, because they're so many people who come through these theaters and, um, whether or not you get to work there again, a lot of it is based on what did they like you, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you like my, I hope to be able to leave places having people be like, Oh, I, we love Carly and we can't wait for her to come back, you know? Um, sure. And with casting directors too, and the readers that you meet in the audition room and the actors that you meet outside the audition room and, you know, the person, the person serving coffee at the Starbucks downstairs that you go to every time before you have an audition, like tip them, (laughs) you know? (laughs) Um, I, yeah, just cultivate, just remember that we're all we're all in it together. We're all, mm. we're all, we all love art and we're all like, really, honestly, my experience has been that most people are genuinely, genuinely good. So yeah, that's what I would say is to just like, keep it kind on my side of the street and, um, hope for the best. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that's fantastic perspective. And it's interesting that that uh, over the past few interviews I've done, uh, that has been the one thing that business advice that mm-hmm. that's been the answer to that question, which I think is very interesting. That's really uh, and interesting. I think it is so true. Yeah, I think it's so true. And it's important to keep in mind. But one thing that that brings to my mind is is the concept of getting away from the idea that you're actually in a competition yeah. with other people. Yeah. Uh, when you think about it in a very short term time scale, mm-hmm. then it makes you feel like you are in competition with other people. Yeah. But when you think about it as a long term time scale, mm-hmm. when you think that you do have the time to get things right, to make mistakes, to learn as you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And to cultivate your career and your business over the course of uh, a long time, then you're not in competition with anybody else. Right. At that point, you're in competition with yourself. Yes. Yes. It's only you that's going to prevent you from moving forward. Yeah. So, you know, that can that can take a lot of pressure off of yourself. Mm -hmm. Uh, That can allow you to breathe a little bit more deeply and uh, and look at people. Uh, not through the lens of competition, but through the lens of um, compassion and uh, and uh, you know, as as cohorts in this uh, creative endeavor. Yeah, because you know what? Maybe you want to put on a show with someone, but you were being a bitch last week because they were, you know, there was something going on that uh, they got some opportunity that you didn't. So, um, right. But I, I totally agree with you. And I need to, I need, honestly, like, I need to remind myself of that. I need to work on that. Like, mm-hmm. um, one thing that, that helps me, uh, cause you know, uh, after school, there's kind of this like post showcase race to get, um, to sign everybody. Um, and, uh, and then like results start to happen. And like, it's so cool to see, my classmates and people I went to school with do and people who Mm -hmm. went to other schools like, you know, NYU Juilliard and things like that, like doing really cool things and showing up on TV shows and in movies and stuff. And Mm -hmm. sometimes I get into uh, a compare and despair kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But then I'm like, someone said to me, um, like, for example, you know, I'm never going to be in fences, right? Mm Because I'm a white, actress (laughs) actress <laughs> right um so i'm not i'm not like that's not i'm thankful that i'll never be in fences you know like that's not my project that's mm-hmm. like okay denzel washington i'm not saying that i would ever th- mm-hmm, this is a bad example okay so let's say you have a director and the director is making is casting their play and we'll use the metaphor that they're making an apple pie right So you've got one actor who's the apples. You've got one actor who's the cinnamon. You've got the pie crust. Hmm. You've got the walnuts, whatever else you put in apple pie. I don't know what what other ingredients there are. Nutmeg, (laughs) maybe. Um, But I'm a banana, right? Right. Even though the director loves bananas. Loves them. He's making an apple pie. He's making an apple pie. He's not making a banana cream pie this time. So... There's no reason that I should start hating myself because I'm not an apple. <laughs> I'm a banana. That's a, that is a a creative way to, what I'm to saying is, look at that example, but I I totally get it and I and I like that actually. What I'm saying is that it's it's, it's really impersonal. It's really yeah. impersonal and it's they're making they're making something and they need the exact right ingredients. And there's not, and, and, you know, you just might not be that this time around. Um, doesn't mean they're going to stop cooking. Right. Hey, so, uh, Carly, is there, um, let's see, are there any books that you would recommend outside of the plays, which we talked about, uh, in some detail, are there any, uh, books that you would recommend either specifically to acting or even just books that you've found that do help you as a creative Mm -hmm. artist? Yeah. Um, Anthony shares the year of the King. Yeah, absolutely. Is, and he has another one about playing, um, Falstaff that I have not yet mm. read, but, um, Anthony share is a wonderful British actor. He plays, he's got a little tiny part in Shakespeare in love at the beginning. Mm-hmm. He plays the like Shakespeare's therapist. Um, but he's right. in, 
a ton of stuff. And he's a, you know, venerated British actor who kept a journal about, about playing, um, Richard the third. And I can't remember when that was. Have you read it, Mike? I have. Yeah. A couple of times. It's a, it's a great book. I mean, it's a great walk through just, uh, you know, even, even the competition factor, even the decisions that we were, we've been talking about just now. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the stuff that uh, goes through your everyday actor mind and how those can get in your way and how to overcome them and how to, you know, stay focused and, and keep cultivating the creative side of your art. I mean, it's a fantastic. I, I've recommended it before. Uh, other people on the podcast have recommended it. Uh, if I can throw a link in the comments, and I will, but you can go to actorceo.com slash resources, and there's uh, a bunch of books and other uh, fantastic resources that people like yourself have told us about yeah so yeah definitely check it out that one's great i also just read brian cranston's memoir called a life in parts yeah i put that up on the resources too oh good it's phenomenal. i haven't read it yet but uh i highly recommend the audiobook read by the author uh oh, because okay. i personally adore brian cranston um mm. uh i love reading act books that actors have written I, I, I also really um loved amy schumer's book the girl with the lower back tattoo Oh, right. Especially for right. women. Um, mm. I mean, she's fucking hilarious, but also she right. has some really cool things to say about being a woman in being a woman actress comedian right now. Um, so I would I'd recommend that. Um, and then like back to like the meditation world and stuff like that. Um, anything. I mean, one of my favorite authors is Marianne Williamson, um, but anything that like kind of just speaks to the spiritual side of, of seeing things. Um, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh, the great Buddhist teacher, I believe, right. um, mm-hmm. has written a lot of that kind of stuff. And, um, who's the other one who people love so much? Um, oh, uh, uh um, oh, oh, I can't remember her name. Um, she's a, she's got short hair. She dresses like a, she's a monk. I think I, oh, I'm totally blanking on her name. Um, but just like things about, um, uh, uh the spiritual perspective on life, however mm-hmm. deep or not deep you want to get on that. Um, I find our various help me center myself and kind of come back to planet earth after, uh, after you know, playing parts that are crazy or just like having a very adrenalized day. So, yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, I wish I can remember. Oh, and I'm not. No. Oh, man, I, I'm really blanking on this woman's name. There are probably people who know exactly who I'm talking about. But um, well, if you find it out, come back to this Facebook live, throw it in the comments. That way everybody else can see it. Yeah. Awesome. There you go. Yeah, that's a perfect way to uh, continue the engagement and make sure that you're getting people. Uh, yeah what what you meant to give them (laughs) oh wait i'm looking it up right now payma chodron oh super yes (laughs) amazing those are my recommendations and go see play yeah those are fantastic recommendations things yes also true jitney is amazing Mm -hmm. jitney Mm -hmm. there's so much good stuff happening this is like pre-tony season for theater so if you can see stuff, if you're in this area or just in your wherever you are, go see theater, mm-hmm. support the arts. Absolutely. Carly, this is an amazing conversation. I'm so glad I got to connect with Me you. Too. Thank, thank you so much for spending your time with us today and uh, sharing your experience, sharing your insight uh, with us and the listeners on the podcast. I mean, this is fantastic. Uh, make sure you remind everybody, tell us uh, where we can find you uh, and then where we can find out about your coaching as well. Uh, fantastic. Um, thank you so much, Mike. It's been an honor. Um, and, uh, you can go to my website, carlyzion.com, C-A-R-L-Y dot Z-I-E-N, or find me on Facebook at Carly Zion Coaching. That's the end of my sentence. Carly Zion Coaching on Facebook. (laughs) You can email me from there. That's beautiful. Carly, thanks so much. Uh, and um, we'll be sure we keep an eye out for you. But um, uh, if you're listening, uh, definitely check out the Actor CEO podcast. You can find it on iTunes. You can hear this episode when it goes up on the podcast. And you can always find out more at actorceo.com. 
All right, take care. Find all the resources mentioned in this episode in the show notes at actorceo.com slash 26. Thanks for listening. Subscribe to the Actor CEO podcast on iTunes and at actorceo.com. 